everyone, and welcome to Collider Nightmares. I'm your host, Clark Wolf. Thank you all so much for joining us this week. We have a lot of exciting and scary news to get to. But first, I want to introduce to you my lovely panel this week. To my left, it is not Perry Nemiroff, who is out of town. She'll be here next week. It's Mark Ellis. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Please Woo! take your seats. Oh, my God. Relax, oh. everybody. I'm put my pants on two legs at a time like <laughs> nobody else does. You guys have been doing entirely too much good work work the first two weeks so i decided to come in here and bring it down a notch oh, i'm yeah. the cooler of collider <laughs> you are too <laughs> kind and to his left we have mr john schnepp what's going on you're not the cooler you're just cooler Ooh, i like there that there you go hey what's going on very happy to be here we're going to talk about some of this in a little minute some sweet sweet they live action and to my right we have mr mark riley hello everyone so excited to be here and you know who's really excited about me being on collider nightmares Who? the ghost that is now in my apartment, turning on my TV randomly all through the really? month. Really? Awesome. Yeah. To, to Animal Planet, right? Yeah, to Animal Planet. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Wait, is that your ghost or is that Cal, your dog, doing that? <laughs> oh, it might be my dog just stepping on the remote now. <laughs> that makes sense. Thanks for bringing it down, cooler. Why oh, wait, wait a second. Or it could be the dog's ghost friend. Hey, that's true. I, I, like, th I like that one. That's the winner for me. I like all ghost of this. Ghost of Cujo. Woo. Ooh, See? Creepy. Setting it off right here on Collider Nightmares. <laughs> all right. Now, before we dive into our fresh meat topics of the day, I wanted to remind you all that Collider is hosting a Comic-Con contest. Yay. Yes. Do you want to go to Comic-Con? We'll all be at Comic-Con. It is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, obvi. Uh, so the contest is for two people to win two badges to Comic-Con hotel, airfare, and a little spending money for you to buy me a cocktail if you so choose. <laughs> it ends on June 30th, so for more details, please click on the link in the YouTube description. And bef also, before we get into fresh meat, Mr. John Schnepp attended the event of a lifetime this weekend when uh, John Carpenter, who some of you may know has released two albums over the last couple of years, mm -hmm. Lost Themes Volume 1 and 2, uh, he played a live show. Now, he's on tour right now, so you can check out his tour dates. But Schnepp, how was this experience? Was it amazing? It was truly amazing. Got the tickets like about five or six months ago. It's sold out it's been playing to sold out crowds everywhere and why is it amazing if you grew up watching Halloween or any of the John Carpenter films and you didn't know he actually did his own scores to almost oh, yeah. all of his own films save for a few like The Thing which Ennio Morricone did but he actually played a tribute to Ennio Morricone when they played The Thing he played all of the hits Oof. all the songs that you'd always wanted to see maybe not like see but that are burned into your brain it was great to actually see them perform it live uh, in front of a packed house house filled to the rim with horror nerds. I mean, it was literally, I couldn't throw a, you know, a chiclet far enough to it would hit somebody. I saw Simon Barrett there. I saw a whole bunch of people who are not even just like horror nerds, but like Rob Schraub, a bunch of pals, all, all there to just see one thing, John Carpenter rock out. And he did with his son and the accompanying band all on the synth, just playing it. Just when they, when they kicked into playing that Halloween theme mm -hmm. song, some of the, some of it just, you transcend into like, you're just smiling and like having such a great time. I recommend it highly to anyone who can actually get out there and see John Carpenter's band play his music. It's fantastic. And hopefully they keep doing it because the Lost themes are also incredible. I highly recommend going out and buying them. The soundtracks are just John Carpenter's Lost Themes, Volume 1 and 2. They are great, as well as just his regular music that he did for all of his films. I can't not say enough about how great it was. I'm so jealous. I missed it. Um, and you had so we have some photos that we scanned through while you were talking, but a friend of yours yeah. took a couple of Charles them. Charles yeah? de la, la, I'm sorry if I'm going to ruin your name. De Lirazica. Lirazica. Charles de la Rizica. He's actually a documentary filmmaker. Nice. Uh, he's done all of these incredible behind the scenes on Blade Runner. Like if you bought mm. the Blade Runner five disc set and saw that incredible, almost feature length documentary that's the man who did it so he does incredible work documenting and he also does like EPK kind of stuff like the Martian mm -hmm. so he's he, he was in the second row I was a little like scrunched back a little farther <laughs> right not those prime seats like Charles got because I think he's pals with John yeah, so it's really tall I mean you I know, know what? nobody may, wants to show up in the second row and see John Schnepp is in the first row my <laughs> giant head blocking their view I always try to scrimp down a little bit like hey man but still so anyway thanks Charles for giving us some of those prime photos they look gorgeous they're absolutely gorgeous and finally before we get into fresh meat, um, something really tragic happened this weekend. Weekend, Anton Yelchin, um, we're a very well-known genre actor, was killed in a really horrifying freak car accident. Um, I, you know, this is not breaking news anymore, but Anton was such a um, presence in the genre community.
community from mm-hmm. horror to sci-fi to horror comedies. Mm-hmm. Um, I was looking at some of his uh, his his credits and it's just amazing, and including the Fright Night remake, oh. which I think he's so good in. And and the movie is underrated on its own, but Absolutely. you know he he to me was just the heart of every movie that he was in. And so I didn't know if anyone else on the panel wanted to chime in on that. I mean, I, I would just say that, I mean, one, it was, it's such tragedy and, and it's a freakish accident and it, he was taken away way too soon. But you said it, he was green room. Uh, I need oh, to see still, but I'm hearing great. just such amazing reviews from that. He sat in the studio and talked about it here at Collider and we got to talk to him. Um, but Fright Night, I want to go back to around to that because it's such an underrated remake. It was so well done. He was amazing. So I'm just personally just shocked and sad that he's gone. And he yeah. could disappear and do whatever role he was doing, too. I mean, you would watch Star Trek, and, and he plays his role well as Chekhov. When yeah. I saw him in Fright Night, I loved the remake of Fright Night. I walked in kind of like, oh, okay, what is this going to be? Is this just a cash grab? And I had the biggest smile on my face walking out. David Tennant was a huge reason why. He was maybe the guy that stole the movie. But you can't have somebody have a crazy performance like that unless someone like Anton is there anchoring it and making yeah. you feel like this is a real place, this is a real person these events are happening to that was always what he could bring to this genre which needs anchors sometimes we love talking about all this freakish ghoul stuff but if you don't have somebody grounding the action and keeping it relatable for somebody like me like i see him in that movie and i'm like that's how i would be reacting to this situation it is so underrated undervalued and uh, and, and overlooked when you're talking about movies like this yeah i think you're, you nailed it when you said he's an anchor he's like he had a natural way of acting and i i got the chance to hang out him a few times he's a metal dude and he was mm-hmm. dating a couple of metal people that i knew so i was like very nice guy very understated just a horrible loss so yeah you know. absolutely and uh, just a couple of other titles i wanted to throw if you're looking to some for something this weekend to maybe celebrate his work or his life most recently he was in joe dante's burying the x which he said the reason that he did the movie was to work with joe dante mm-hmm. duh yeah uh star trek obviously and uh only lovers left alive which a lot of people love oh, um great performances across the board in that one. I don't love the movie, but acting is fantastic. I and love it's a the movie. Yeah, lots yeah. of people love the movie. I'm in the minority on that one, but Anton's fantastic in it, and uh, Green Room, like you said, Mark Riley. Be sure to check that out on yeah. VOD uh, or Blu-ray if you can. So, rest in peace, Anton, and that's it. Okay, so let's get into Fresh Meat. Uh, first up. Now, after the ses- success of The Conjuring 2, it was no surprise that Warner Brothers and New Line would be planning an Annabelle-style spinoff. This week, it was announced that the Nightmares panel had it all wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and instead of the Crooked Man, the nun, heavily featured in the promotional materials, and you can see her right there, would be getting her own movie. It was also revealed that the nun was actually added completely during a series of reshoots in the spring, just two months before before the movie premiered, which is a crazy story in and of itself. So, uh, Mark Ellis, I will start with you. Are you looking for? Do you feel like you need more Valak in your life? Here? Oh man, I could always use more creepy nuns, man. <laughs> this is just such a great. And and I was shocked to hear that the nun was totally added in reshoots. See, Rogue One fans, reshoots can be a good thing. Don't worry about it. I loved her in The Conjuring too. I thought that was the scariest part about Conjuring too. Leaving that, I. I wasn't thinking about the crooked man. I wasn't thinking about Tom Wilkes. I was thinking about <laughs> the nun. Because mm-hmm. I went to Catholic school for the better part mm-hmm. of my educational history, and nuns can be scary. I think that this nun deserves her own spinoff and is the second scariest nun in the history of cinema. The first scariest, obviously, going to Amanda from this movie, Nightmare on Elm Street oh! 3, The Dream Warriors. I'm not going to give away who Amanda is, but go watch <laughs> it. And even though she's not like a bad person in the... She's not a scary thing, but just she's wearing the away uniform. It's all white, and it just scares me <laughs> mm. to no end because of how her storyline. That's a subplot in the movie plays out. Back to The Conjuring 2. Sometimes you spin off something you're not sure if it's going to work, like with Annabelle. You know, yeah. you look in in that room in The Conjuring, and you say, oh, oh, all the scary props in here. Sure. Let's uh, the, the treasure chest, the Muppet. No, no, no. Let's go with the doll right there. This seems like a good movie because that nun is scary as hell. Now, John Schnepp. So we learned, okay, now I guess this is going to be, uh, let's get our spoiler alert ready for, thank you, Cody. Uh, okay, so we've got our spoiler alert for people who have not seen The Conjuring 2 yet. Uh, Valak is right. the name of this demon. And uh, we figured out that the 
way that Valak was defeated was by knowing its name right. and saying its name. Now, now that we know how to defeat Valak, John Schnepp, what are your thoughts? Do we need a movie about Valak? Yeah, they're gonna need to bring in Superman's friend, uh, that weird wizard, Missile Mitzel Crickle Plick, or however you say his <laughs> Mr. name. Mr. And then you gotta trick him to say his name backwards and then bring Valak with him. And then involve Rumple still Yeah. <laughs> Get a bunch of people who learn how to say each other's names backwards so they can keep getting each other back in the, all right, you got me, now you get me. So anyway, I don't know. Um, I don't know how they're gonna get Marilyn Manson to play the nun again. I mean, he's, he's gonna get a lot more cash now that it's a solo film. Um, yeah, learning about the nun being added in post, it felt like that when I saw the film. I remember we saw it together and I felt yeah. like I, I was a person who was kind of a little bit more negative. Like I liked the film, but I found that it was a bloated ending. It just kept going and like how many more cr creatures are gonna chuck in here? You got the crooked man, you know, you have this freakish nun, then you got the old man, what is it, a little oh, tiny, Bill. yeah, I mean, who's, who else is gonna be in here? It felt like too many creatures or whatever. And when it, finding out that it was added in post, it kind of makes sense. I think it needs needed it but you know maybe they could have cut out some more of the other stuff is what I guess what I would have said okay but I'm looking forward to the nun I want to know more about Valak <laughs> <laughs> all right that's fair now Mark Riley you were a huge fan of the conjuring too yes uh are you know and and as we as I said in the intro we all were saying more we was we were, we were saying crooked man yeah for sure yeah. but now it's not looking so so what are your thoughts on this as somebody who's such a big fan of this movie well I mean I'm I'm gonna see this nun movie because <laughs> like Mr. Ellis said nuns are creepy and uh, I would love to see a, a, a nun spinoff from Dream Warriors just an FYI <laughs> but uh, for this I think you, I think you said it Clark what so you learn the name defeats the demon well I kind of agree with you Schnepp on, on the bloatedness of Conjuring 2 if I were to give some notes I would say that that was a little forced in my mind so let's go to this movie and learn how to defeat it by figuring out it's the name mm -hmm. how does Lorraine Warren figure that out. I think it's, we're reliant on the fact that she's a medium. So she can just go, you know what? I know, you say the name and it's gone. But wouldn't that be great to get a little mythology with this movie? Like, what does the name mean? Why is it named this way? What, why is this demon Valak? And why is, what, what does it do? Mm -hmm. uh, that's what I wanna know. Cause you have the creepy imagery. It's already iconic. Get Marilyn Manson, he's not doing much. So <laughs> I, I, I'm in. The only other thing that I would say is the, the magic or the, the terror of Valak, aside from being horrifying looking obviously, is that Valak can control other demons. There you go. That's what we've learned, right? We've learned that Valak was the one pulling the strings all during The Conjuring 2. It wasn't old Bill who wanted to torture these kids and it wasn't and she kind of essentially created the crooked man as well right. so the only thing that would make me actually excited for this movie because I feel like we saw too much of this nun in all the promotional materials mm -hmm. I don't feel like I need another movie with her right. but if this gives way to other demons being controllable maybe more crooked man as a result of Valak still or this Good nun call. being in, in mind maybe that would be interesting to me Nuns date crooked men. They're not allowed to marry, but they hang out. They fraternize with crooked men. You heard it here first. You just broke the story, dude. Yep. That's it right there. Yeah, I'm just playing off the greatness of Carpenter. Nuns <laughs> and <laughs> crooked men. Part Done. two. Yeah, <laughs> terrifying. All right, we can lose our spoiler alert now. Thank you. All right, moving on. Two new posters for two very different genre films recently hit the web. First up, the new one sheet for J.A. Bayona's A Monster Calls, only hinting at the aforementioned monster, voiced and played by motion captured Liam Neeson. The family drama comes to theaters on October 21st, and next up was the international poster for David Sandberg's feature film debut, Lights Out, based on his short of the same title. The one sheet shows a ghostly feminine figure lurking in the darkness. Lights Out comes to theaters in the U.S. on July 22nd. Mark Riley, you look very nervous and uncomfortable. What are your reactions to these posters? I was shaking my head because that the Lights Out poster, it's just like... Based on that trailer, that short that we watched when we were at WonderCon when it, when it came out, my God, I just I see that poster. I'm like, nope, mm -mm, nope, <laughs> stop it, stop it. And that's what that poster does for me. Mm -hmm. So I'm excited. It looks great. As far as a monster calls, I am so, you had me at Liam Neeson motion captured. That voice in the mm -hmm. trailer, uh, I mean, he's got something going on. I love the work by Jay, uh, how do you pronounce Bayona? his name? Bayona, thank Bayona. you. I cannot wait for this movie. So these two posters, they look great. I'm excited. Uh, great. John Schnepp, what are your thoughts here? Yeah, I definitely feel like that Lights Out poster, it, it's exactly what the movie's gonna be. You're yep. gonna be like jump scared to probably death, have five heart <laughs> attacks. 
maybe poop your pants after the film is done. You're going to be a mess, a liquid mess. So get ready for it. Because just that short was yeah. freakish and scary. When I, How many years ago? Like maybe two years ago? Yeah. I remember watching that and I was like, literally freaked out. Like, horrifying. And to know that that's like not a 90 minutes now is uh, I can't wait to get scared by it. I really am looking forward to it. A Monster Calls feels very different to me. Mm -hmm. It definitely like, I, I'm excited to see where it goes. Like, I don't know if it's going to be a BFG kind of cuddly, mm. friendly monster, or is it going to be freakish or or what? But from the the trailer, it definitely looks like a, a like a horror kind of I don't know about action film, but horror fantasy. Or yeah, maybe like, like that. a more childlike drama. Well, yeah. I think in Pan's maybe labyrinth yes, kind of flavor. And I was just about to say in the vein of the orphanage, perhaps mm. which Bayona also directed sure. himself. So you know, a, like a drama, heartfelt maybe with family elements, focusing on a little boy or a small child, um, and things that scare him perhaps mm -hmm. i don't know mark ellis yeah the the monster a monster calls poster is something that i'm cool with it looks like schnapp said bfg or even pete's dragon where mm. oh this thing is really scary and imposing at first will it end up being a friend and actually defend me against the real enemies that one might come across in life so i'm fine with that poster <sighs> this other one i mean this movie looks so <laughs> scary lights <laughs> out is something where i i really appreciate simplicity in horror movie posters don't show me everything mm -hmm. don't throw the whole thing at me just give me something really basic that's what this is you just see that visage of what looks like a young valak uh who <laughs> is ready to and every time you look at that poster and you look away then you look back she's uh, a little closer uh -huh. yeah. a little closer the keeping the lights on i, I love everything about this because it's it intrigues somebody who's leaving a movie theater and they just glance at that post like, what the hell is that? Ah, that's going to be scary. It tells you exactly what this movie's going to be. Can't wait for this. That's a great point, Mark. And uh, so I've seen Lights Out. Mm. And uh, Ooh, that's right. I will say that I feel like this poster is a very good representation of this movie. Oh, good. So that's all I'll Got say. Got a weird little light switch that's <laughs> it's not working correctly. <laughs> what? What's going on? Oh, God. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. scary. You look well rested, so you look like you, you're you getting just fine sleep, unlike the gentleman all the way over there whose TV's turning itself on. Exactly. So. Mm. Yes, indeed. Mm. You're not sleeping well. You Maybe you've got a lights out monster. <laughs> yeah, I might. Yeah, that's fine with me. You know, we're... We're, we're, you know, I have something to bring to Clyde or Nightmare. That's that's true. More <laughs> episodes of Animal Planet. Yeah. You know, I just can't seem to sleep, and then I just watch these things the ghost demands that I watch. All the ladies love Mark Riley, even the undead one. That's yeah, that's right. Right. yeah, touche. All right, next up, Eli Roth, director of Cabin Fever, Hostel, and The Green Inferno, is set to direct Bruce Willis excuse me, I lost my voice for a second, in a remake of the cult favorite Death Wish. The vigilante tale originally starred Charles Bronson as a man whose wife is murdered and daughter is raped during a break-in. Roth had previously been attached to the shark film Meg over at Warner Brothers, but left earlier this year due to creative differences. He is replacing the directors of Rabies and Big Bad Wolves, who previously departed due to their own creative differences. Apparently, they wanted to adapt the original novel a little more closely Mostly, while the studio was looking for a more direct remake of the 1974 film. It's also important to note that Bruce Willis has signed off and approved this script. So John Schnepp, what are your thoughts? Do you Are you nostalgic for the original Death Wish? Um, you know what, it's funny, because the original Death Wish with Charles Bronson was a straight up serious film, mm -hmm. and then once it got a couple of the sequels going, it really fell into the bizarro, highly yeah. recommend seeing Death Wish 3, just insane. Um, but uh, you know what? I like that Eli Roth is going to direct this. I kind of don't like that Bruce Willis mm. is going to be in it. I would like them to go. I hope that, you know, with this change of the guard, maybe they will sign him off and get like a different actor, someone who you wouldn't expect to play this revenge seeking person who goes on a death wish hunt, like becomes a vigilante. Mm -hmm. I just think Bruce Willis is a little bit uh, to be played out. I mean, he's in all, like we were talking about this on Movie Talk earlier. He's just in all these direct-to-video kind of movies that he doesn't care about, and he's playing this kind of like, you know, the same kind of character. Mm -hmm. So I, it doesn't make, excite me that he's in Death Wish. It might have like er, like 10, 15 years ago, yeah. but I, I've, I would love to see them go with someone different. Yeah, he is a little, I mean, I'm not saying Bruce Willis is too old for the part, but I mean, he may be a little older than I would have expected for mm. a role like this, but who knows. Um, Mark Riley, what are your thoughts on Eli Roth being in the director? chair here it gives me um, it gives me a little bit of hope uh, because well first off I want to mourn the loss of Eli Roth on Meg a yeah. giant dinosaur shark that eats people and I, Jason Statham can stop it and Jason <laughs> Statham stopping a dinosaur shark 
Mark Ellis and I love shark movies, obviously. We so. love the premise of Meg. Yeah, so, so whoever is on board with Meg, I'm on it's your team. It's John Turtletop, actually, is oh, going to be directing now. So. It's like right. National Treasure. Maybe you, you got <laughs> to ride the shark into the uh, into See, some museum to save the Declaration of Independence. And that just illustrates my point, actually. Eli Roth directing Meg is the movie I want to see. So <laughs> that... I, I, I just like him more for that kind of subject matter. So when you carry him over to Death Wish, I'm intrigued. Um, but I'm with you, Schnepp. I do not see Bruce Willis in this role. However, I'm going to be cautiously optimistic. Um, there's a great article on Collider.com announcing this by Matt Goldberg, and he brought up some. You know, it's tricky doing a, a movie about vigilantism or vigilanteism uh, in this kind of. I guess what we're living in the society it's we're living in now. Point. So it's it's a little tricky. However, if they do it hard, if they do it gritty and violent, I think it needs to be a violent, straight balls to the wall Death Wish remake. Then you can maybe get me. And but I am cautiously optimistic. I just hope Bruce Willis doesn't phone it in. Hmm. He's been phoning it in a lot lately for many years. Yeah. yeah. So. You know what I I just thought of, and I know I'm I'm always pushing for this. I realize, but I would love it if this remake was set in the 70s. Mm. Now, that'd I think be great. That would mm -hmm. be kind of cool for sure. But yeah. anyway, okay. So Mark Ellis, you have seen the original Death Wish. Um, what are your thoughts here? Uh, the, it's going to be a very different tone than the original Death Wish. I think they're going to take elements of Death Wish and whatever the producers say is fine. It does look like because you got Bruce Willis in here, he might try to make this his taken or his equalizer, mm. I, which yeah. I don't necessarily hate that idea. I know Bruce Willis gets on the horn or licks a lot of stamps and mails a lot of his things in, but Eli Roth coming on board. I like Eli Roth as a director because I appreciate his passion. What he said, though, is that he wants to get away from doing stuff like Hostel right. and Green Room, which is why he's on board with Death Wish. I myself am not that on board with this decision just yet. Mm -hmm. But it's one of those circumstances where I hope I'm wrong. So I want to see a trailer for this and say, that's right, this is the Eli Roth I want to see doing this movie Bruce Willis has committed. There's just too many factors going on right now. There's too many variables for me to say, this is a great idea, this film needs to be a go. So for right now, Clark, I'm very much looking forward to Meg, the shark movie, <laughs> and then <laughs> Death Wish. We'll see. <laughs> All right. Well, to be fair, actually, uh, you know, Eli directed this movie called Knock Knock that came out last year. Yeah. And it was divisive. Um, some people thought it was really goofy. Some people thought it was pretty good. Uh, and it was a loose remake of an Italian film. So I think that this move for him actually makes a lot of sense. And I was in the camp of really enjoying Knock Knock. Um, I didn't think Keanu was great in it. However, I thought the two girls were great. I thought it was a really tight, you know, contained... Um, um, thriller and I don't know I thought it brought more to the table than I expected so with that in mind I think that this is really exciting and I'm definitely on board but like you said Ellis I think that it'll hinge upon seeing a trailer mm -hmm. and you guys all bring up the point of Bruce Willis and I think that that's fair however the fact yep. that maybe he's stuck with the script through the different directors and through the changeovers maybe that shows that he actually really wants to make the movie here's hoping yeah. okay next section my favorite thing What's in the box? 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 Mark Ellis, you need to hear your what's in the box. What's in the box? <laughs> okay. I, did, I was hitting the high notes. Yeah, that I'm was like, good. I'm the it's unsung the... member of the band. I'm just here what's playing bass. What's in the and box? You're like, oh, Schnepp's background vocals are great. The reason why Schnepp sounds so good is because I'm hitting that That's soprano. Right. <laughs> oh, good. All right. It, go team. Go team Collider Nightmares. So um, the first thing up in what's in the box is Penny Dreadful. All right. So, guys, uh, last Sunday we saw the end of Penny Dreadful. Dreadful, not just for season three, but the show, it will no longer, it will not be coming back for a season four. So let's go ahead and put our spoiler alert right there. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, so since the gentlemen on the panel are not caught up, um, I'm going to take this one because a lot of you Dreadfuls out there have been tweeting at me about this. And um, Penny Dreadful was my favorite show on TV. So I'm really, really, really disappointed about wow. this. Yeah, wow. I'm really upset. Um, however, I want to just bring up two quick points. With regards to the season three finale being a season finale, I thought it was great. I thought that was a great way to end the season. However, being a series finale, I am not on board with this. Um, mm. Unfortunately, you know, so if you do some reading, um, you will see that John Logan and the president of Showtime, John Logan is the creator and mostly sole writer of the show, basically sat down 
And they said that they came to this conclusion together. Um, you know, obviously Showtime. Look, Showtime is the network that kept Dexter on the air mm -hmm. four years too long, in my mm -hmm. opinion. So I think they would have kept doing Penny Dreadful as long as they could have. But um, basically, they go on to say that it, it was John Logan's decision to end the show. Um, for him, the show is Vanessa Ives. And once Vanessa Ives' story was concluded, was played by Eva Green, um, then that's the end of the show. Now, here's the problem for me as a fan of this show. Basically, in season one, Vanessa Ives, it's her story, and then you have all these wonderful characters that flank her, right? Mm -hmm. And they're, and it's an incredible ensemble cast. Season two, however, I would argue, they really give everybody in the show a lot more to do. There's, you're invested in their characters, more so than just, oh, they're a supporting cast. Now, obviously, Eva Green's Vanessa Ives is the most important character, she's the lead, but I think that they really took those ex that extended season because I believe in season two they got 12 or 13 instead of the eight they started with. But, um, but the, so such that at the end of season two, all the characters are split up across the world, all over the world, and nobody is together. Everybody is on their own. So you start season three with everybody basically trying to come back and Van to Vanessa in some way. Um, you know, they gave us such incredible characters like Lily Frankenstein, um, like uh, Dorian Gray. I wanted to see more from him. I thought it by the end of season one, Reeve Carney was just starting to be become fascinating. and. Um, you know, the creature is obviously a fan favorite too. So without monologuing too much for you guys, I don't know, I'm slightly disappointed at the way, the fact that this is it because they introduced us to a character like Lily Frankenstein because they brought in Dr. Jekyll mm. in oh, season wow. three. We see this wonderful uh, actor. I, I, gosh, I don't remember his name, but he's absolutely fantastic. Dr. Jekyll never turns into Mr. Hyde. We, and, and so there's something in me that says, I don't believe that this was John Logan's plan from the middle to end of season two, as he says. Because if it was, why would they tease us with Dr. Jekyll? And if it was, why would they, you know, allude to Africa and mention the mummy Emotep? You know what I mean? Like they're, they're planting all of these seeds in season three that led me to believe that we were going to continue seeing these classic monsters play out and ultimately, they kill Vanessa Ives in the end. It's it. She's sacrificed, um, and uh, because ultimately her character can't continue any longer. And it's. But here's the positive, and I'll wrap this up. I know it's me talking for a long time, but the positive is these last two episodes that aired on Sunday to me were the reason that I fell in love with Penny Dreadful in the first place. All of the characters come back together and they are all fighting together to challenge Dracula, one of the most epic villains, mm. you know, and they really treat Dracula with that kind of respect. Um, the other thing I would say is that they, um, they do, they create these night creatures which are essentially zombies. And the night creatures are raised by Vanessa succumbing to Dracula and man I loved the way that they handled the night creatures basically taking on zombies in this world mm -hmm. the last thing I want to say is gosh darn it Josh Hartnett he is one of the most underappreciated actors working today I thought his turn as Ethan Chandler was heartfelt, emotional, powerful, strong. Um, you know, I just can't say enough good things about all of the performers on this cast. And um, I'm really gonna miss the show. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm gonna end it there. Um, that's my little Penny Dreadful recap. I'm sure you guys will have a lot to say on Twitter and in the comments. So we, we have each other. We can start a Penny Dreadful support group if we need to. Um, but thank you, Penny Dreadful. Hey, that's Clark, it. Yes. I was gonna add one thing. You please, can take this, but I, no spoilers, because I can't spoil it, I haven't seen it. But the one good thing about it is it made it three seasons. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, you find a series that happened like five, six years ago that only made one, yes. made it one season. I don't mind it when series are go two seasons or three seasons and don't even get come to some conclusion because that's just like life. We all die.
We don't get to choose when we wrap it up, and neither should shows. I think personally, if you get a chance to wrap it up, by all means do. Yeah. But sometimes you don't get that chance, and they just are able to just complete one storyline right. or give you that that one thing. Sometimes they don't get the chance, and it's canceled while they've already shot everything. So that's kind of the roll of the dice with television and cable and extended programming. We're getting spoiled now with sh shows like HBO. I mean, yeah. uh, sorry, uh, Netflix, where you have entire seasons that they drop all at the same time. So at least you're like look, I've got these 13 episodes. And you know? I do believe that Vanessa Ives' story was a complete story. Mm -hmm. They, I, I do, and you're absolutely right. Maybe they didn't tie up all the other characters that we had come to know and love, but that was the only way that her story was going to end. And I'm glad that he knew because he could wrap, John Logan could wrap it up. There's this beautiful title sequence at the beginning of the finale that is special. It's to, it's different. It's all the characters where they are. It's a different musical arrangement. Um, and then the final shot is just the end. It's very theatrical and you're absolutely right, Schnepp. Like, a show like this, the fact that it got almost 30 episodes mm -hmm. of a real budget on a real network, yeah. I mean, it's theatrical, it's sexy, it's dangerous, it's dark, but it's also poetic and beautiful. Where do you get to see that anywhere now? Hardly anywhere. Yeah. I mean, as somebody who is both sexy, dangerous, and dark, <laughs> I want to binge this. I've been looking forward to watching all these episodes, and now I get the chance to catch up by the time they green light season four somewhere. Maybe <laughs> it's somewhere else. Maybe it does go to some sort of streaming Maybe. platform you never know in this day and age because I've heard a lot of fans have a similar outcry that while they like the episode and they like the way that the season ended they just aren't satisfied because you have all of this content available and we don't get to tell those stories so if it's loud enough we've seen it happen before maybe it happens with Penny Dreadful yep. yeah fingers crossed I wouldn't be I would not be mad at that I will say that all right thanks for your patience moving on this past Sunday HBO dropped the most recent look at its much anticipated drama series West World, based on the 1973 feature film that was written and directed by Michael Crichton. Uh, so though the television production faced delays, creator Jonathan Nolan uh, told io9 that basically the delay in production was because they were making a period western, a science fiction movie, and Alien, Days of Heaven, and Unforgiven <laughs> simultaneously. Um, yeah. So it was just a big undertaking. It, that's in reference to the production um, shutting down earlier this year. But it's back on its feet a few months later and still slated for a fall 2016 debut. Uh, Westworld is essentially the story of a robot theme park gone wrong and stars Anthony Hopkins, Tandy Newton, Ed Harris, James Marsden, and Evan Rachel Wood. J.J. Abrams also serves as a producer alongside Jonathan Nolan. Mark Ellis, where are you at on this? You had me with the names J.J. Abrams, Jonathan <laughs> Nolan. You had me with that still shot of Anthony Hopkins and Jeffrey Wright, and then actually seeing the trailer. Ugh. Holy so crap. This good. looks like something I've never seen before. And HBO is a company that I trust in developing their content, in making television shows. You've seen what they've been able to do. Game of Thrones is only one of dozens of examples of HBO crushing it when it comes to their material. So yeah, I love the way this trailer looked. I like the Western vibe and then mixing in with some weird sci-fi thing and maybe we're puppet masters controlling this little Western town. It just all looked like there's multiple layers of storytelling and every one of those layers looks fantastic. It's like a seven layer dip you'd get at Taco <laughs> Bell, except, you know, without the bad ingredients. Mark Riley, you know, I, uh, I watched this trailer and I think, man, this is a show that could probably go on forever yeah. you know there's so much potential here and uh and and it's such a gorgeous trailer and there's a lot going on what were your reactions yeah layers <laughs> lots and lots of layers this thing has well it, you know what what occurred to me was that casting report that came out where it was like batshit crazy needing some extras that are going to be uh, little, let's get a little spoilery or, or a little raunchy here. Genital to right. genital touching mm -hmm. and a lot of things of that nature. Back. You didn't get <laughs> a call back, call Alice. Back. No. Well, they had some notes for you about your genital to, to genital touching. What? Did I get a little too handsy? Come on. <laughs> You're a little grabby at the audition. Right. No, really? but my point being that that was crazy to then see it in action. Not that, but to see 
not only the androids, the theme park that's going, the actors there, the tone, the talent involved. We got Jonathan Nolan, we got J.J. Abrams. Man, this thing can go on forever. I think it looks fantastic. It looks interesting. I can't wait. Wow. It, it will certainly ambitious. And, you know, it's no secret that HBO is sort of looking for programming to take Game of Thrones place, mm -hmm. yep. maybe to take The Leftovers place. Uh, John Schnepp, what are your opinions here? Like, are you excited for this? Do you think this is something that could go on for a while? I think it's fantastic. And uh, honestly, when they first announced it, I was like, finally, someone's redoing Westworld. Because, <laughs> like, it was great to watch this trailer. And then immediately what loaded up on our friend YouTube was the old Westworld trailer, <laughs> wow. which I watched. And I was like, you know, we always complain about trailers ruining movies. They've been doing it for decades, kids. <laughs> decades. This this old Westworld trailer, I think it was Richard Benjamin, uh, was the actor. He's like, literally, they t they show you the entire wow. movie with Yul Brenner chasing him down at the end. You're like, he's going through the old Roman times. He's a cowboy, but he's breaking, you know, like the original Westworld was all these like three different go back into the past, and they did a sequel where you're in the future. I cannot wait to see this version, which is all of that plus more. Like you said, they've got the, the, the science fiction mystery behind where like they can actually do that now where I think in the 70s they were a little bit behind as far as not able to pull some of these the robots off. They just had the face removal mm. and that's it. This looks really fantastic as a science fiction nut and a horror nut. This looks like a great combo of both. So I'm I cannot wait. And you know what? We were always talking about reshoots and stuff, too. Sometimes you need it. Yeah. They pulled production. They're like, up, up, wait, we got these five episodes. We got to figure this out. We need a break. So they took three months. I'm glad they did because now we yeah. get this cool series. Hopefully all 10 episodes are amazing. And we're like the same thing with the Game of Thrones. Like, oh, we got to wait a year for the next <laughs> Westworld. So I'm all in. I cannot wait. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And, you know, fingers crossed that the series is great. But if it is, which I think it looks and I hope that it is, you know, the idea that a network is saying, let's let's take our time here. We know what we have. We want to be in the business. We want to be in the J.J. Abrams, Jonathan Nolan business. Mm -hmm. We want to make this something that can last for a long time. Let's let's make sure we get it right. You know, if that really is the case and it proves to be true, then then good good on you, HBO. And I cannot wait. Yeah. Um, all right. Next up, according to Deadline, the Guillermo del Toro produced Carnival Row has been ordered to pilot by Amazon, created by del Toro's. <laughs> such a great photo. <laughs> Created by Del Toro's Pacific Rim writing partner, Travis Beecham, Carnival Row stems from a major development deal Amazon Studios inked in early 2015 for the project, which is a TV version of his cult 11-year-old supernatural feature script, A Killing on Carnival Row. Um, so basically... The premise here is that, oh, I lost it. Here we go. Uh, it's set in the future in a city called the the Burge? The Bruges? B U R Burgi? I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. I don't know. Sorry, <laughs> I go with guys. Berg. Uh, Berg, sure. Um, that sounds about Berg right. <laughs> Which looks a lot like 18th century London. It is inhabited by humans and other creatures, and a serial killer is on the loose. So, Mark Riley, you mentioned that you have the opportunity to read this, this feature script, which, yeah. as we just said, has been in development for 11 years. Are you excited to hear that Guillermo del Toro is involved and that it might be a series? Yeah, I think, I think it lends itself very well to a series and I'm glad that the whole team is involved because I did read this script it was back when I was uh, an intern in development it might have been 11 years ago and it was one of the best scripts I've ever read it's mm. it was fascinating it had great characters at the center of it is this detective um, there's a real Blade Runner vibe to it but in a fantasy world so if you can think of like Blade Runner meets Lord of the Rings in a city like London that's what you're getting and I love it so this is interesting. The series, uh, I, I would love to see Guillermo come in and, and direct the pilot, maybe direct a few of them to set the tone to, uh, the tone in the right place. I'm glad that they're bringing in uh, the original writer uh, as well, I, th I believe, to, to do this. It's a fantastic idea. So I'm a little bummed we didn't get the movie. The movie would have been fantastic. Sure. But if we're going to get a really great series, which I think you will, this has some some great. This is a great opportunity to be stunned by a wonderful story. All right, Mark Ellis, where do you stand here? Are you on board with this? I want Del Toro to executive produce everything. <laughs> I love yep. his imagination. He's such a creative visionary. I don't always love the directing choices that he makes. I wasn't a huge fan of Crimson Peak from a storytelling standpoint, but it looked gorgeous, and that's what I'm hoping to get with Carnival Row. That storyline sounds insane, mm -hmm. and it just doesn't matter if it's real 1800s 
1800s London or some futuristic city that feels like 1800s London, whether it's Jack the Ripper or somebody else, you're always going to have a creep running around the streets with a top hat and a cane and some sort of like long coat kind of thing. It looks like Scrooge, except he's not going to be good. He's going to stay bad. We got to stop him. I love hearing about this concept. Now. Yeah, and it could be an alien with a top hat, you know, because it's like <laughs> this is like a really Hello, weird mixture. Hello, <laughs> I know, right? A big frog face creature with veins <laughs> pulsating. You know, this reminds me of uh, uh, did you uh, uh, Riley, did you read The Tourist? That was like a, a, a late oh. 80s science fiction film that also had like tons of different aliens and a murder mystery, but it was at this Ooh, hotel. Cool. Giger did a bunch of designs for it. It's uh, this just reminds me of that. And that oh, also, yeah. yeah, the possibilities yeah. Of what they could do with this film, I mean, I mean, that's why I actually like that it's a television series because yeah. we get more of it. I'm greedy yeah. like that. I don't want just 90 minutes or two hours. I want 13 <laughs> hours of this. Come on and make it. And that's the thing. I, I always like. Come on, Amazon, or whoever's making this thing. Why just do a pilot? Just rock on and make all 13. Have yeah. some vision. Have some hope. It's Guillermo. Yeah. You know, it's like I would just do it, but you know, that's not my money. So yeah. I'll just wait for them to make the pilot and then agree to make the 13 episodes. Well, you know, and Amazon has becoming. A, they're expanding what they're doing a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. We got the Man in High Castle, which right. is kind of a high concept totally. um, f show, and then, but you know, they're as of now they're most well known for stuff like Transparent and yeah. more more drama oriented right. things. Or um, so I am excited to see them taking up the genre mantle. And yeah. this was a this was a bidding war, you know, to to get the rights to this and to be able to do it. So I would imagine that if they have this kind of talent involved and they went out of their way to get uh, to acquire the rights to this in the first place. I would hope that they send it to series. Yeah, I hope so too, because it, it, the story deserves it. And you're right, Schnapp. You can expand that and get greedy because it's yeah. it's worthy of it. All right. So next up, we're going to move on to our next segment called Monster of the Week. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to make sure I didn't miss the boat on that I, one. You I nailed it. I was hoping you do the high pitched one. <laughs> There we go. Yeah. <laughs> Nailed right it. Here. All right. So this Friday, Nicholas Winding Refn's latest feature, The Neon Demon, hits theaters. Uh, starring Elle Fanning, Bella Heathcote, Abby Lee, and Keanu Reeves, The Neon Demon is a violent, dark, slightly comedic look at LA's fashion industry. Now, Schnepp, you and I have both seen the mm -hmm. movie. Um, I personally... I love Neon Demon. I, I'm not being a little humble bragger here, but I've actually seen it twice. <laughs> and I was really taken with it the first time, but I wondered if I saw it again, it, how I would feel. And I liked it just as much, mm. if not more, the second time. Um, what about you? I know you you had really positive things to say about this one. I absolutely loved it. And you know, Nicholas Wendy Riffin, if you followed his career, starting out with the Pusher trilogy, then rocking on into like Bronson, Valhalla Rising, just every single movie he's done just keeps kind of he's expanding and then like going into different directions but it feels like a film that he made like only god forgives and drive are totally different even though they have ryan gosling in them they're mm -hmm. completely different films a lot of people all, all their the only thing they can rec see is drive that's all they've seen right so then they see maybe the neon demon it's a very different film it's not drive at all but it's got those elements that are obviously Nicholas Wendy Refn's style now. And with his take on uh, the modeling mm. world of Hollywood, the narcissistic, very plasticky, fabric-y kind of like horrible horror world that a lot of people live in, this is just one person's outside look into it and like kind of like making these little digs and jabs. I loved it. I absolutely thought it was. It's like a dark comedy. It's a really black comedy. Yeah. Black, black, black. Absolutely. Hmm. I, I per Blacker than the blackest black <laughs> times infinity. Blacker nice. than the blackest black. <laughs> you know it. I, um, I, you guys are going to have to start a, a Collider Nightmares, it's the album. It's not bad. Yeah, right? we might have to do it. Um, you know, I for me, seeing this movie, because, you know, I had heard, I'm sure like most of you guys had, it's very sensational to say, oh, it was booed at Cannes. And, it, you know, again, this is not me being a humble, braggy jerk, but I've been to Cannes. Everything gets booed at can. Okay? I'm just going to say, it's, it's not. They're grumpy over there in France. Should, Get on should. the beach. Enjoy yourself. Yeah. Right? The French Riviera. You did sheet. You should uh, be bragging about that. I got booed at Cannes. <laughs> oh, really? Amazing. Yeah. I applaud Free you for getting dinner booed. Dinner on us. Yeah. <laughs> but with that being said, you know, for me, I feel like if there is a negative reaction to this film, you know, obviously everybody's entitled to their own opinion. But as a woman who has lived in Los Angeles since she was in her early 20s, I identified with this movie 
so much, so many different characters, obviously not in the extremes that the movie eventually goes mm. to, but you know, I really thought that this was a very personal film and it was, I felt like it was actually very heartfelt and authentic. Now, yes, it is a dark, very black comedy, which I love. Um, and additionally, it is, God, it's gorgeous. Mm -hmm. This movie looks incredible. And I gotta give a little shout out to Abby Lee. Abby Lee is the Australian actress you may have seen in um, uh, Mad Max Fury Road. Mm -hmm. She oh, yeah. is one of the co-leads in this movie. She was great. She is oh, so good. Thanks for calling her out. I was also gonna say it's a female DP. He mm -hmm. sought her out. Yep. And he, cause she does a lot of fashion photography. So it really, the, the cinematography in this is on point. I'm glad you brought her out. The Holly mentioned that. The, the Fury Road actress, she's like, she is demonic. She's in amazing. This. Yeah. She's great. So, all right, boys. Now, are you guys excited for uh, The Neon Demon? Are you intrigued? What are your thoughts? Absolutely. I'm seeing this movie. I'm intrigued. I love the imagery going on that the, when they dropped a trailer i mean that was just like i took acid for you know two minutes <laughs> i was like yeah man i'm in so come on i'm in how about well, you Ellis? i'm not as big of a drug abuser as you <laughs> i i have was, issues I, I i was mixed on the trailer i like the promise this movie could have it's a rubber match for nick was whining ref and for me because i thought drive was really good i could not stand only god forgives i some people love it and they're like hey you idiot you just don't understand it maybe i do understand it. i just didn't like it hang on a second Ellis didn't understand. <laughs> maybe <laughs> maybe hey, that's look, we, the truth. We, that's the greatest thing about movies. We could love movies and hate movies. I just some of us are right and others are wrong. All that's I do happens. is trust my opinion. <laughs> I like your opinion. And so I, I do want to see Neon Demon for no other reason because I want my faith in this visionary filmmaker Nicholas Winding Refn to be restored. Hopefully, this is the movie to do it. Maybe this isn't. If you if you didn't like Only God Forgives, this is a very abstract I've, I've film. I've heard the same exact thing. That's if all I I'm didn't saying. like Only Only God Forgives, yeah. I'm not gonna like. All I'm this. saying is it's an abstract film, and it's not it's not as narrative as Drive is, and it, it's a challenging film. It asks you to take jumps with the film, and you have to get, kind of just go with it. If you just go with it, I think you'll enjoy it. Don't don't come in with like any story expectations because well, it gets weird and additionally i would argue because as the only person on the panel who was not the biggest fan of drive now mm -hmm. did i dislike it no of course not but once i finally got around to seeing it i was like her like you know what i mean right. this, this right. is it right. so um that's just my own opinion but what i would say is where i believe that where drive is like an exploration of male violence i think the neon demon is an exploration of female violence mm. Mm. very much and, um and so i think if you can go into it with that mentality and that mindset to sort of look at it in that way you you may enjoy but listen this is not going to be a movie for everyone and i wouldn't necessarily call it a horror movie right. as it's being billed but it is horrific in a lot of ways. I would add Valhalla Rising mm -hmm. is one side to the Neon Demon because ah. it's, it's almost abstract male violence as this is with female violence. Interesting. All right, so our prompt for Monster of the Week is, guys, what are some of your favorite horror movies that take place in Hollywood about mm. the making of the movies? Well, I could, I could yeah, call one ahead. out right off the bat because we talked about it yep. a little bit earlier. Me and Clark are big fans of Starry Eyes. Yeah. Oh. And that's straight up right in Hollywood. People like walking around, right? I I live in Hollywood, so I was walking around. That's my corner, you know, like weird. <laughs> I loved it. I actually love the premise. I love the execution of it. And it's truly like a, a freakishly haunting, like updated, almost like Rosemary's Baby yeah. for right. Hollywood starlets. You know, it's really good. I highly recommend that. That jumps out for me. Mm -hmm. Ellis? You know, in Los Angeles, there's a lot of old ladies asking for a lot of bank loans, and sometimes it goes all <laughs> wrong with Drag Me to Hell. Dude, yeah. That movie scared Drag me the hell. crap out of me, because a lot like what Riley's going through right now, after I saw that movie, <laughs> there was just this this old, not old, I'd say middle-aged woman who would just come into my place and just suffocate me, and oh like, it was like it was like a demon. It was something, it was maybe it was like sleep paralysis or something, but like, nice. I'd be in bed, okay. and then she'd just lay on top of me and like, and like choke me, like I couldn't wake up. <laughs> I this is real or a happening. dream? This is, this is real. This is happening. And um, there's and then no way this is real. Th th it was actually real, and it manifested itself uh, after I saw Drag Me to Hell. So I blame Drag Me to Hell. Wait, Sam Raimi, it's your fault for the sleep hang paralysis. On, hang on Are a second. Are you pulling our leg? A I'm real, not, no. real old woman would come <laughs> into your house and just like randomly lay on you. You felt the presence of an old woman. I thought you were saying an actual old. an actual old woman just coming in, laying on you awkwardly. That happened too, but that's because they pay me for my services. All right. Well, then that makes a 
little more smile. Wow. Okay, you were so. like, hey, not so much uh, side cheek there. Like, just randomly laying. This is Mark like Ellis's Hollywood horror story. That is a true horror story. This is unbelievable. This is like the Conjuring prequel we got here with Mark Ellis. It, it happened, and uh, and I stand by my story. Uh, the other one I'll throw at you really quick is Zombieland. Uh, because mm. I know oh, that they're yeah. going to a lot of different locations, but when they end up in the greater Los Angeles mm. area and they go to a certain famous person's house, oh, yeah. it's one of my favorite parts in a movie. It may be the best cameo of all time. Good I choice. Agree. Good yeah. choice. How about you, Riley? Well, I go to one of my favorite movies all time, which doesn't necessarily take place in Hollywood, but it's about an actress. She's on the film set. And that would be The Exorcist. Mm. Ooh, nice, she, right? She's gonna, she's doing, the, and I love that juxtaposition of her character, kind of pretending to, you know, to be in a movie and everything. She goes home to the house. Or I, I guess they rented it or something, mm -hmm. or, um, and you know, her daughter gets possessed, and then we have to deal with The Exorcist. So. What a great, what a great movie yeah. for that! Yeah, and Schnapp, you kind of mentioned Rosemary's Baby, yeah. also the story of an actor who's willing to go to extreme lengths. I also want to throw out there Wes Craven's New Nightmare. Right, um, that's right. a good I, one. I, good one. I, good one. I, I, love, <laughs> I love that movie. I think it was misunderstood when it came out, but it is aged very, very well. If you can get past the fact that Bob Shea is not the best actor and neither is Wes Craven himself. Yeah, they're um, all right. It's, they're okay, <laughs> sure. Uh, but, uh, but it is such a, it's such a great movie and, and, um, and has aged really, really well. Yeah, I mean, around this time, uh, <laughs> Freddie started doing like off nights at the Funny Bone. You know, yes. like he started yeah. having a lot right. of comedic lines and what New Nightmare, one of the many things it does so brilliantly is it doesn't totally lose Freddie's sense of humor. It doesn't yeah. totally lose yeah. it, but it does get very dark and not, it's no longer, he's not Rodney Dangerfield right. Right. anymore. You know, when he just like, he pops up, he's like, miss me. It's like, yeah, it's a little mm. comedic, but it's also very scary. And I loved everything New Nightmare did. Also, I guess you could say Woodsboro, California is sure. where Scream takes place. Well, so Scream 3. Kind of Scream yeah, 3 Scream takes three. place on yeah. movie set. Yeah, yep, there right? you go. Um, and I also wanted to add, this is the end. Yes, the Seth Rogen movie. Yeah. You yeah. know, I, that is a That's horror a good comedy one. if yes. I've ever seen one. Those guys, I love that movie it's so much. Fantastic film. Um, it's so good, right? Yeah. And uh, and it it plays with Hollywood, I think, in a in a really really great great. Good double yeah. feature, Shaun of the Dead. This is the oh, end. Oh, totally. That's a great I, I was just coming off a hernia surgery when I saw this is the end. I think I was like two or three weeks out and it was my first uh, screening after post-surgery because you're pretty much laid up and you got mm, stitches yeah. I was I had to leave the theater twice <laughs> because I you're was la yeah. I oh. was literally concerned that I was laughing so hard you're gonna re-herniate yourself I was gonna burst the stitches oh. so. yeah. I, uh, I saw it as a double feature with The Conjuring oh, wow. the first nice. Conjuring followed by This is the End nice. and uh, it was a very good palate cleanser totally. for the true terror that I had just experienced <laughs> so those are just a couple of our favorites you guys weigh in too what are some of your Hollywood fate. TV too I, I wrote down uh, American Horror Story Murder House uh, and also uh, Mall Holland Drive. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Um, there's lots yeah. of great ones. So check it out. Ch uh, tell us some of your favorites, and also don't miss the Neon Demon in theaters this Friday. And let's move on to your Twitter questions. Yes. I love that the graphic changes into red. It's so great. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Uh, okay. So first up from our uh, very good horror friend Kyle Anderson, he asks if you all have seen Cabin in the Woods, which monster would you want to have summoned out of all of them? Which is a great. <laughs> question i love this question so ellis we were talking before the the show and and we all kind of shared our choices but you wanted to keep yours a secret yeah so. well i i mean i had as my starter i had the giant snake i oh. yeah. because if i can conquer my fear of snakes i can conquer anything in life but i also i mean that elevator scene when just all of your nightmares just come piling and spilling out it's one of my mm. favorite scenes in a movie so brilliant. i remember there being a shark and now i can't remember if there was a shark or not so if there was was a shark in there? Look, it's a big week for sharks. They have a big movie coming out in the shallows. I'm a huge fan. That's how I want to go out personally. I love sharks. That's what I want to see happen before I go, is I want to be face to face with a shark. If it's the one from Cabin in the Woods, if there even was one in Cabin in the Woods, that's who I'm playing ball against. Uh, all right, John Schnepp. It was probably a zombie shark. It might have been a zombie yeah. shark. Uh, I love this movie. It's such an amazing film. It came out of left field. I was like, yeah, this movie they've been trying to release. Ah, it finally came out. I'll see it. Loved it. And I absolutely love that sequence you're talking about where like they're in the elevator and you just see all those chambers with all Ding. the different monsters from all these different genres and films. So I thought it was a really great, uh, great way to like 
share your love of monster movies. Yeah. So tip of the hat. I, I would uh, like to have the uh, murdering unicorn. Uh, <laughs> the one that just kills you with its horn of love. Right. Uh, what a fantastic horror monster movie that would be. Just a murdering unicorn. I love it. I love that one. All right, Riley, what's yours? And, and yes, I have seen Cabin in the Woods. It's brilliant. So there's a bunch that stand out in my mind. Um, remember the, it was like the, the home invasion yeah, doll the faces, the strangers. Of, yeah. I've always had a, a fascination with those movies because I, I immediately put myself into that. So I'd take them on because Ooh. they're not getting in my home and I don't care about your scary doll faces. So I, I would take them on or a very close second. Remember that like weird goblin uh, with the horns? He like got on the golf cart and took it and just <laughs> drove off. That screw that guy. I could take him easy. So I, I would take him. Wait, wait, wait. What if they? What if they tear their their little weird doll face off and there's a freaked out monster face under it? That yeah, that's a good whole too. different story. Okay. Then whole different story. I'd be probably screwed. If you right. guys, I just realized as we got into this topic, I maybe should have thrown up the spoiler alert thing, but I don't think so because eh. come on, I don't know. We're actually Came not out. spoiling yeah. the movie that's though. The thing. Yeah. There's and a whole conceit behind I, it that yeah. we're not giving. I agree, and I feel like if you do have not seen Cabin in the Woods and you've heard us talk about it and you go, wait, the movie with Chris Hemsworth, like, what are they yes. talking about? Right. Now you have a reason to yeah. go see it. And uh, in addition to it being awesome, mine is the ballerina that has the weird, totally. like, you know, head thing. And do you know what I'm talking yeah. about? Yeah. She, I have to say, that cosplay, some of the, I saw someone at Comic-Con maybe two or three years ago <laughs> doing that cosplay. Whoever it was, she nailed it. It was absolutely incredible. So uh, ballerina gets my choice. I love Captain. Nice. One of the best uses of an Ario Speedway wagon song in a movie ever as well. <laughs> That's it's right. so good. It's so good. Chris Hemsworth for the win. He's I'm going to start so working on my screenplay Murder Corn. Right now. <laughs> Murder <laughs> Corn. Murder you know what? Corn. If anybody could animate that and make that amazing, it's you, John oh, yeah. Schnepp. We know who killed Uncle Ben, but what got Aunt May? The murderous that, unicorn. That's right. <laughs> All right. Next up, Kristen Ofrio writes, do you think that jump scares are still an effective tool as long as there is a legitimate scare involved? Which I think is a great question. Question. Mm -hmm. uh, Riley, you want to start this one? Yeah, I, I think that the jump scares, they are alive and well, if done right. And I believe that they add so much. They're, they're a part of the tool chest that mm -hmm. good horror directors utilize because what it does is it kind of, it brings you down a bit. You get that jump and then you laugh and you release that tension. And then if you're a good director, like many of uh, the people we talk about on this panel, they go right in for the kill. Mm. And that's what I love. You set up the jump scare. As long as it's done in the story and not done, you know, sometimes movies rely on these sure. things, just loud music or just something that jumps out at you and, you, ha, 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 and they walk off. Right. No, you gotta use it, then get the audience to go, oh, it was nothing, and then go. Yeah. That's where you can use it, and I love it. One so. of my favorite stories I've ever heard is um, Steven Spielberg talking about making Jaws mm. and talking about adding in the Ben uh, oh God, what's his last name? Ben Gardner. Ben, ben Gardner. Gardner. Mm -hmm. ben, the Ben Gardner's boat scare with the head that oh, comes God. up. And it's so effective. But the, the important thing was that I took away from it was him saying, look, once you get the audience like that once, you're never going to get them again. Right. So you better really use that first big scare effectively. And boy, did he ever. Mm. Uh, gentlemen, how about you? Yeah, you as a I, fan? I, I, I love that Spielberg quote. I, I would disagree with him that, that, that when and you do see the shark for the first time in Jaws in full form that it doesn't have a punch. I get what he's talking about, but I consider those two different mm. kinds of scares. Sure. I think the jump scare ain't going anywhere and I'm glad it's not. I love a good jump scare. I, I even like the false front jump scare when it's like, oh, it's just a cat. You yeah. know? Then wow. the next time you get a jump scare, oh. you know it's going to be something real. Criticizing jump scares in horror movies is like a construction worker saying, man, it's really hacky that we use Phillips head screwdrivers. It's like you, <laughs> yeah. you know, they're one of the building blocks of hard. Now, yes, they can be used too much. They can be done in a very cheesy fashion, but when they are, uh, it, w when they're conceived properly and you pull them off the right way, there's some of the best times you'll ever have in a movie theater. Yep. Definitely, Schnapp. How yeah, about I'm you? Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. Joe. That scared. I think I saw it when I was six, and that scared the hell out of me when that opened the thing and the head bobbed out. Yeah. And I was with my sister. Really, <laughs> <laughs> really thank you, Steven Spielberg. Um, uh, jump scares are necessary. I don't think you can never not have enough jump scares. I like I like the cheap ones as long as they add up to something I like a double jump scare and then nothing for almost two minutes and then a th the thing because mm -hmm. it's all about building in the tension 
And I think, you know, The Conjuring had a lot of good jump scares, the original Conjuring, and then it just kept going and going mm. and just really built up this horrifying tension until the double ending. It yeah. had an ending, it had another ending, which was even more, far more horrifying. Um, I think jump scares are necessary in horror, and it, like Riley said, it's a release. Mm. Like, sure. you're like, as you build this tension, that, oh, and it's like, hey, what are you doing? It's just some friend. It was like, and then, you know, then they turn, and there's the creature, but it's through the mirror, and only one person saw it, so it's a fake jump scare. If both people saw it then it's a real jump mm. scare so there's a whole bunch of different like you said the tools to use whether it's a bucket or a cat or a creaky door or somebody's knocking on the door those are all valid jump scares especially if someone's like I'm totally looking up the demon's name and ah what's that you know <laughs> it's a crow at the window oh god okay. then it's behind you <laughs> you know like the sinister where it's like what's wrong and you see the little demon's face right behind the guy that got me yeah. even though it's a corny weird like painted demon scared the hell out of me so I mean the, I love them you know who's yeah. great at jump scares Nuns. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ellis, That's you right. brought up Drag Me to Hell a little earlier, and that one to me is just like, uh, it's like being in a, in a, um, carnival Funhouse mm. because that's the fun of walking through those old like creaky goofy little things where the, the thing pops up yeah. and you go oh god it's so and then you go ah oh, ha ha that's so dumb yeah, and there's <laughs> there's a live live and they're waiting for you yeah. yeah Drag Me to Hell opens with such a bang the music oh, and Drag so Me to good. Hell they use that like old school violin that they only use in horror movies I've never heard another violin <laughs> sounding <laughs> it's like they just got it out of an attic somewhere from the 1800s but it is so effective yeah go watch drag me to hell basically that's what we're trying to say yes. all right and finally from alex Cavanis, uh i got to see yoga hosers this weekend and loved it good i'm glad you liked it made me wonder what some of your favorite splat stick flicks are hmm. which is not only a tongue twister but the first time i've hmm. heard the term splat stick <laughs> uh, but i love it that's great i'm gonna go ahead and start uh the first one that jumped to mind was dead snow mm. oh, i yeah. love dead yes. snow so much uh it is silly and fun but also scary and a total gore fest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I am on team dead snow. Nice. Um, all right, so Riley, how about you? Have you guys seen Peter Jackson's Dead Alive? Oh, oh yeah. Oh, good choice. Screaming in the theater with him when he's got the chain, like the, the mower, just, mower, just mm -hmm. taking him out. Oh, the very, yeah, the very start of the movie. I mean, he makes a point to show you that lawnmower coming into place. You're like, that's going to come back sometime. <laughs> yes. Listen, good. Dead Alive is one of his very first movies, and you're talking, he just unloaded blood oh. everywhere it's a kid uh, somebody gets bitten by a monkey they become zombies the sumatra kill, the sumatra monkey, monkey. Yeah. and it's one of yeah it's it's where peter jackson started if you can believe it and it's just ridiculous balls to the wall gross Blood everywhere. Highly recommended. Good choices. Yeah. Schnepp? Well, the, you named one of the all-time favorites all of mine. Times, I, right? You know, I got to see it at a midnight screening with when that sequence and a few other sequences like the Kung Fu Priest. <laughs> when those things happen, <laughs> it was not just me drunk, but like eight or nine people around me like getting up in the theater. <laughs> yes! You know, just cheering. And that's that, a great point. You have to see it with a bunch oh of people because I did a, that. I saw it at New Bev with a bunch of people. It's built to be seen like that in a theater. Um, I loved Evil Dead 2. Yeah. yeah. Now, that is a mm -hmm. key splat stick if you want to like just see Bruce Campbell just literally they had a hose of different flavored K-Row syrup colors blasting through a door and he's just getting jacked by it at the end that's one I mean that's it I mean I don't think Shaun of the Dead is splat splattery so I'll leave it at Evil Dead 2 yeah, that's a good one. All right, Mark Ellis. Yeah, with splat stick, if you got to put, I want some comedy in my splat stick. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to be really gross, one of the ones that I remember thinking, because I couldn't quantify it as any other kind of genre, was the Toxic Avenger. Oh, oh yeah. Because it, it, it's so gross, but it also has a sense of humor in totally. there. And then I also, just because Riley brought up Dead Alive, I was thinking of another Peter Jackson movie that's less splat, but more stick, and that would be The Frighteners. Mm -hmm. Not I love a whole the Frighteners. lot of gore in that movie, right. but I love the concept. I love how it can get very serious, but also have a sense of humor at the same time. Frighteners is an underrated movie. Check it out. Good choices, I everyone. That. I love this. And good panel. Thanks for being here, Mark Ellis. Oh, are we done? Yeah. What, are we, that's uh, goes, that's it, it goes buddy. fast, doesn't yeah. it? I it's go it's over. Over. <laughs> I'm gonna As soon as I get off, I'm going to run around the block. I'm going to get back in line because I want to ride this ride again. Yeah. Well, good. I love hearing that. And uh, come back anytime. You guys are amazing. Thank you guys for what you guys have done for this genre mm. here at Collider. So excited to be a very, very, very tiny, insignificant even, part of it. A very important part of it. You <laughs> shut your mouth. He's a non-cooler. He's cool. <laughs> so that's going to do it for us today here on Collider Nightmares. I would like to thank my panel. Uh, to my left, Mr. Mark 
Ellis. Where can they find you, Mark Ellis? Uh, well, this weekend on Saturday night, I'll be at the World Famous Comedy Store on Sunset Boulevard in Southern California, where they make a lot of horror movies. Do, and you can find me on Twitter at Mark Ellis Live. And Mr. John Schnepp? Uh, I'm just at uh, John Schnepp on Twitter and Instagram. And, t- and in two weeks, I'll be at the Florida Supercon getting extra sweaty. So come on, rock out some horror questions, heroes questions, whatever. I'll see you there. Speaking of heroes, when is Heroes on? Oh, that's right. You know, since we moved, we used to be on these Tuesdays. We're happening right now. But now we're on the next day, which is the sweatiest day of the week, Wednesday, when comic <laughs> books come out. That's when Heroes is out. We'll, we'll be talking about Justice League and a bunch of other cool superhero stuff tomorrow. But right now, we're still talking about dead creatures and monsters. <laughs> Nice. All right, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Mark Riley. Yeah, make sure you check out Schnapp's Heroes. I love it. Um, <laughs> you can find me at Riley around on Twitter and Instagram on every Thursday on the Schmoes No Main Show. And I pop up every once in a while here on Collider Video and next week on Collider Nightmares. Yeah, Can't wait. Yeah, next week. All right. And I am at Clark Wolf. Clark with an E. Wolf with an E. Basically everywhere on the internet. Thank you all so much for watching. Hey, guys, be sure to send your questions. Use the hashtag Collider Nightmare. Some of you are sending some great ones. I'm pulling lots of them. Uh, banking them for weeks to come but go ahead and and send us your questions and uh thanks so much for watching we will see you in your nightmares hey guys if you like this video click the thumbs up button also make sure you subscribe to our youtube channel it'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at collider